Hello, everyone. If you've been here all day, thanks for sticking around till the end. If you're just joining us, welcome to CNEN's second annual virtual symposium, Advances in Drug Discovery and Development. I'm Lauren Wolf, the head of the science and tech group here at Chemical and Engineering News, and I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Jeff Blaney. He's the director of computational chemistry and cheminformatics at Genentech. Before joining Genentech, Jeff was well, Jeff was busy. Uh, he was an executive at SGX Pharmaceuticals, Metaphorix, DuPont Pharmaceuticals, and Chiron, just to name a few. And before that, Jeff obtained a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry from UCSF. He's got many years of experience in industrial drug discovery, research, focusing on structure-based design, high-throughput docking, combinatorial library design, and chemical informatics. And in just a moment, Jeff will be presenting his talk entitled, Enabling the Best Structure-Based Design Engine, a Human Expert. Sounds pretty intriguing to me. Uh, I'll be back to moderate a Q&A session immediately after Jeff's presentation. Please feel free to ask questions anytime. Just click the Q&A button in the bottom left corner of your screen. And if you need any technical assistance during the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your screen. A few notes and then I promise I'm done. Please note that CNN does not endorse any products, uh, any company products or services that may be mentioned in this presentation. And finally, uh, and most importantly, this talk will be archived and available on demand at the conference website for three months after the live broadcast. Uh, that's until December 16th, 2015. And now I'm delighted to hand it over to Jeff. Thanks. Um, Hi, everybody. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of how we have um, combined conventional uh, one and two dimensional chemical informatics tools with 3D tools to bring structure based design capability, not just to computational chemists, but to all our medicinal chemists, crystallographers, other scientists on our big interdisciplinary project teams. Um, Part of the background for this is starting probably around 2000, the advent of high structural or high throughput structural biology crystallography really happened. Um, I joined SGX in 2002 and got to see um, probably one of the most powerful platforms for doing that. I've been at Genentech since late 2007. And here and in many other places, it's now pretty common for the majority of our small molecule project teams to have uh, pretty rapid access to co-crystal structures, which means at any given time in a project, we might have dozens to, in several cases, several hundred co-crystal structures. And that meant the challenge then of how you navigate all of that and make them easily accessible for design, um, hypothesis testing, a big part of that then is bringing all of the other data to that and then bridging these 2D and 3D worlds. So we, we started there realizing we wanted to connect a bunch of conventional tools. Uh, docking we use mostly for pose prediction, so predicting how a small molecule would be likely to bind into a site, not so much for virtual screening. Uh, for virtual screening and um, finding additional analogs to known uh, active compounds, uh, one of our favorite tools there uh, was ROX, which we supplanted with the fast ROX GPU accelerated version several years ago. So that really does provide interactive shape feature searching. Um, pretty sophisticated conformational analysis tools. Uh, we're big fans of the, the drastically improved database and search tools from the Cambridge database uh, that that group has produced over the years and have integrated that with some of our tools. I guess and as a side, I'd mentioned something there that I think is a conceptual change in the last decade or so, which is that small molecule crystal structures in the Cambridge database really can be relevant for structure-based design, not in predicting a receptor-bound conformation, but in giving you a really valuable database of what the preferred torsion angles and distributions of torsions are. Um, and so that's how we've integrated that. The folks at uh, Chemical Computing Group with Mo have done a nice job of hooking that into their tools as well. Uh, 
our approach to structure-based design and ligand-based design for that matter is all hypothesis driven. Um, we're big on calculated physical chemical properties, which range from pKa to log p to log d, a variety of other properties. We've also invested heavily in machine learning approaches for, um, I'd say, more classifying in vitro and in some cases in vivo DMPK. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then finally, we want to stuff all that stuff into software that makes it easy for you know, non-data specialists, meaning you know, medicinal chemists and, and other scientists, to actually integrate all those data to help make decisions in this sort of complicated multi-parameter optimization space that you know, we live in in the small molecule world. Right. So one of those was minimizing the amount of effort that a non-specialist needs to do to interpret protein co-crystal structures. So all of this stuff is scripted in a, a common infrastructure, but it's customized for each one of our projects teams, whether, whether it's a specific kinase or a nuclear hormone receptor or whatever the target is. Those set, uh, sessions update dynamically as new crystal structures get deposited. Um, that also includes structures that might involve an off target that we're interested in for selectivity. In some cases, there might be some crystallographic surrogates, maybe a chimeric protein. Those all get included in a, um, a project specific session uh, in PyMol or in Mo. One of the tricks there, of course, uh, crystal structures, uh, particularly those that come from the protein data bank, if we use those, don't necessarily have correct connectivity for small molecules. Within um, our internal structures, we do better there. Um, and the main trick we use for that is represent the small molecule connectivity based on the way they're registered in the corporate registration system. Of course, that might mean that the tautomer is not quite right because uh, tautomers, of course, could change on binding. Those get updated manually based on visual inspection. We haven't built automated tools for that. For each protein class, for example, a kinase, we will choose a reference um, kinase and then orient all of the other members in that particular project to that um, so that they are consistently aligned and oriented. Um, and I'll show you in a few more slides how we've grouped them to make them easy to find particular crystal structures by substitution pattern, by ligand family, by conformational class of the protein and so on. Um, in the last couple of years, we became interested in some of the new tools for trying to assess the thermodynamic stability of water, such as Schrodinger's water map, open eyes, schmap, uh, a tool with a similar goal, but very different implementation from Desert Scientific called Proasis. Um, we also annotate all these structures with color coding a solve an accessible surface. I'll mention in a moment why I highly recommend that solve an accessible surface rather than other views. And something we, we finally we got in place for all of our project teams recently, the slide says soon, but it's finally done, is to make it really easy for non-crystallographers or non-computational chemists to view electron density maps in that modeling session. Right, so how do we classify all these data? Um, the graphic there is a PyMol. And for those of you that have used it, you'll know on the right-hand side, as with many other viewers, you can, uh, each, each row shows a particular model, in this case, a co-crystal structure. Each one of those are tagged by the name of a chemical class. You can see that in that table on the upper left. Each one of those are definitions that are maintained in a project specific way, usually by the computational chemist on that team, who will assign tags that are the sort of the favorite names for a chemical family um, that that project team would use. You can see that those are associated with the SMARTs. Um, those of you who are computational chemists or cheminformatics people will know about that. And for the rest of you, SMARTs is a very powerful language that makes it very easy to specify a substructure so that we can easily identify what would the core of the MATNET be. 
or adenosine or purine and, and so on. And those are dynamically affi affined so that all the ligands that fall in that particular class that map that, match that substructure feature um, get recognized and grouped that way. We can also group them based on protein conformational class. For example, a kinase is a DFGN, DFG out. This is all to make navigating a session that could have several hundred co-crystal structures um, much easier. Right. So this one's zoomed in a little bit. We've also, um, as part of this CAN project session, have pre-computed what in PIMO are called scenes. You can do equivalent things in other software. This initial one is just a, a Jane Richardson style uh, protein ribbon diagram. Um, those are great for getting sort of a conceptual view, but if you really want to zoom in and get involved in design and trying to interpret SAR, then we'll zoom in on the binding site. Also want to mention on, off to the right, you can see that we have the reference structure always at the top. That's what everybody's aligned to. We have these other objects we call multi-state objects. Um, those are, in this case, different representations of all of the ligands. And there might be a couple hundred ligands in here. This is the way Pymol's set up. We mimic something similar in Mo. If I were to select that first item, it's actually the second one there called all lig, I can then use the down arrow on my keyboard or the down arrow on the, uh, the Pymol user interface to skip from one leg into the next and quickly browse through all of them. And that gives me a really easy way to look through a whole session, maybe find out if there's a group in a particular pocket. As we go farther down where you see that set that says main target and other targets, uh, in this particular case, the main target would be able, other targets would be related kinases that maybe you would want to include for selectivity reasons. So this is what a more detailed um, active site view would look like. Now in this case, I've expanded one of the particular able co-crystal structures. You can see we're showing a solvent accessible surface. Uh, most graphics programs today can display this in what's called an interaction surface. Uh, Pymo calls it solvent accessible. Different programs call it different things. The point is that if you look at that surface, you see the surface that's available just to the stick model of a ligand. It's easier to visualize. Um, if you use a like Connolly molecular surface, they tend to be prettier, they make nice journal covers, but most of us have a hard time visualizing the complete surface of the ligand that would be necessary to fill that larger volume of a Connolly style surface. That's why we recommend this one. It tends to be easier to see small crevices, nooks and crannies, and pockets that you should think about filling. Um, the bottom of the slide gives a literature reference from a few years ago. This was a really nice paper. I highly recommend. It's a collaboration between Berend Kuhn and others at Roche Basel with uh, Neil Taylor at Desert Scientific. And they came up with essentially a series of expert rules based on analysis of the protein data bank and Cambridge database for what are preferred interactions from a geometric point of view. Um, those are all described in that paper. Those are available through software called Proasis. We've used that as part of the infrastructure for building these uh, structure-based design sessions. And you can see those different color-coded dashed lines in there. Each one of those is a different kind of a contact from a hydrogen bond to a, uh, maybe an edge to face, an NH pi interaction, van der Waals, halogen bond. The system's pretty smart and do a, a pretty good job of picking up things like aromatic CH hydrogen bonds. And we'll also flag things. You'll notice there's a kind of in the center of the screen, a red dashed line that it thinks is an unfavorable contact. Um, occasionally we'll see that that's a misinterpretation of electron density, but once in a while it really does appear to be something that would be suboptimal. It's suggested design opportunity for how to improve it. So this is the view we recommend for everybody to start with and thinking how they start analyzing that structure where there's pockets that may open and close. 
as they can easily move through multiple co-crystal structures, they can begin to assess where the flexibility in the protein is. Right. Um, Pinewell is a great visualization system that pretty, falls pretty short for molecular editing and designing analogs. And for that, we move into Mo. Um, Mo has become a really good visualization tool also and the preferred tool that we use for molecular design. By now we've taught um, essentially all of the medicinal chemists how to use this and uh, they're all pretty expert at this. We've integrated the same type of visualization features I showed you from Pymol into here. Um, and I, I guess I should also emphasize the concept here is all designed by analogy to known active molecules. We're really not attempting de novo design from scratch. Um, so this kind of reference-based design could be simple analoging, it could be a core scaffold hop, it could be making a hybrid from two or three multiple molecules that are overlapped. Um, so the you know, Roche colleagues at what used to be the Nutley and Palo Alto sites and Basel sites uh, did a lot of work optimizing sort of the workflow for these menus. Uh, we participated in that eventually also, a pretty good collaboration with the folks at CCG to really come up with an optimized workflow for chemists. So we're not worrying about tools like homology modeling or, or maybe some more complicated workflows. We've really focused on what's the process for editing a molecule, doing um, a reasonably good job of energy minimizing it, just to make sure that you're in a good local minimum. We're not attempting here to predict potency by QSAR or FEP, MMPBSA or any other methods. Just assess is that small molecule in a good local minimum. Um, again, one of the, I think the other conceptual changes that have come about by the increasing number of co-crystal structures in the protein data bank and also analyzing structures in the CSD is the observation that strained small molecules bound to proteins are an exceedingly rare event. There's quite a bit of literature on it. I'd argue most of it's wrong due to misinterpretation or poor refinement of electron density maps. You'll see there's some more recent literature. Sorry, I've not cited them here from people at the CSD, uh, OpenEye and a few other groups have published on that. If you reanalyze those structures, you'll find that the quality of the ligand energies is assessed by either an initial method or molecular mechanics indicates that there's very little strain energy, if any, left over. Um, for the way conceptually I think about it and like to teach others, small molecule has very few degrees of freedom to dissipate any strain if it fits not ideal into a binding site. Protein has thousands. Uh, collective very small motions are gonna be within the noise of what a, even a high resolution crystal structure can see. But twisting a small molecule torch and even something that many chemists might think is relatively flexible, for example, like um, a butyl chain or an ethyl group attached to a phenyl ring, those actually have pretty significant consequences energetically, which is why you rarely see them outside of the preferred range. So here you'll see a Genentech menu down to the right-hand side. Uh, that's a custom menu that we've built right into the Mo menu. That includes in it our calculator physical properties, conformational analysis tools that are not available in Mo. Um, some including a, an approach that Alberto Govinar group has developed for calculating the strain of a small molecule. Um, access to docking tools other than the docker in Mo. Fast rocks from OpenEye, which is this uh, uh, GPU accelerated very, very fast uh, shape feature search tool that we use a lot, um, mostly for suggesting new analogs. We use that for hybrid design, finding new cores. Um, Degas, I'm not going to have time to tell you about that, it was a tool built internally. Um, that is for taking a molecule that you've designed registering it into a database that we maintain that's separate from the corporate registry of virtual molecules that are proposed on a project team to be considered for synthesis. Um, 
I should also mention behind the scenes here, all this is done with pretty lightweight tools with web services. One of the things we look for in any of the software systems is they all are easy to integrate. We try to minimize the amount of custom software we build by working with software systems that are easy for us to connect to. Next slide. Right. So there's been a lot of work done here, um, inspired by work that some of the people here, I think, first saw from Pfizer several years ago. Um, building machine learning models that can classify um, key DMPK experimental measures that we rely on. So here, our, our DMPK group routinely does in vitro clearance measurements in liver microsomes and hepatocytes for five different species. Uh, we measure plasma protein binding, permeability and efflux, uh, time-dependent inhibition of a variety of cytochromes, um, and also um, try to build models correlating in vivo clearance with in vitro measured clearance. That's described in that reference at the bottom of the slide. Uh, I'm not going to have time to describe uh, how the machine learning models are built. That's also mentioned in that paper. I'll just summarize it by saying they're, they're based on simple descriptors like circular fingerprints, uh, calculated log P, PKA, um, there's a variety of machine learning models or methods that we use. Uh, the one that's used most frequently would be random forest for those of you who are familiar with those methods. The goal of that is to come up with a qualitative classifier so chemists or others designing molecules can assess the probability that a molecule that they're proposing would have undesirable clearance or plasma protein binding, TDI, and so on. And we've achieved you know, reasonably good results with these. Um, not great. The key thing I draw your attention to in that histogram over time is after we introduced a human liver microsome model, the number of stable molecules on a percentage basis did go up over time. Doesn't look like a huge difference. I'd argue it is a significant one. There's a lot of molecules made. Those are accumulated over 25 to 30 different small molecule projects. Um, I should also mention that one of the things that helped do this um, was setting department-wide goals in, in discovery chemistry about hitting specific thresholds with um, reasonable clearance criteria. I also emphasize these machine learning models. They're not a mechanism-based model. They don't offer mechanistic insight. They're pretty much a black box, and they are trained by experimental data with molecules already in-house. If you're working in a brand new series, they're not going to be very useful, but over time as more mem members of that series accumulate the models, do a better job. At their best, they probably approximate the most experienced medicinal chemists we have. Uh, another one that's a challenging one to untangle for project teams is the case where you have time-dependent inhibition of a cytochrome. Um, on a few projects, that's been a serious problem, hard to solve. Again, machine learning models have been useful in a probabilistic way to help prioritize which molecules are most likely to get you where you need to go. Um, on the y-axis, in this case, there's a calculated probability of having time-dependent inhibition. The x-axis shows um, the experimental result for those. And you can see there's a lot of scatter, um, but what was learned empirically in this particular project is by keeping, keeping that calculated probability below about 0.6, you maximize your odds of not having a serious TDI issue. Another big challenge, I think in, in Every company I've worked in, as the, the moderator mentioned, I've been a few places before. Now, almost every project team here is solubility. And obviously, if you can't get a soluble enough molecule, you're never going to be able to dose it. And some projects in early stage, teams can get misled in chasing an apparent SAR for, a, say, a biochemical assay. 
But if the molecules are poorly soluble, that SIR you're chasing could easily just be solubility because not enough of the molecules getting into solution actually get a valid biochemical result. So Dan Ortwein and others in our group did a lot of work on comparing different models published in the literature, building our own models, and actually found that this model published several years ago by a group at GSK uh, performed better than anything we'd seen. It's not perfect for sure. It's a very simple classifier, easy for people to think about. It's simply count the number of aromatic rings and sum that against calculated log D at pH 7.4. Um, for the latter, we use uh, molecular discoveries, MOCA. We find that works well across a large number of experimental PKs that we have here and also from Roche. So this slide is actually straight out of the GSK publication. But, well, that looks pretty good. So the green guys are where you want to be. The red ones are where you for sure you do not want to be. So the next slide, Dan compared that with Genentech and how solubility data. And we're pretty astonished to see that it works just about as well. That threshold, whether it's at seven on this slide or at six on the previous one, is somewhat project and series dependent. We find that it generally lies somewhere between six and seven. And for sure, it's, it's not a correlation, it's a simple classifier, but that has helped drive um, behavior and design in the right direction to get us to more soluble molecules. I should mention in passing, we haven't stopped there. We have some work going on in the group to see if we can come up with some better models. Um, one of those looks pretty promising, still early days. So if it turns out to really work and stay on the test of time, we'll, we'll sure describe that later. But for now, this has been a, a useful model. Next slide, okay. And over time, again, the results are not really super dramatic, but I draw your attention to the size of the red area, which are really the brick dust molecules, and that has gotten smaller over time. Uh, the green has actually gotten a little bit smaller in the last year. Um, you notice the orange and the yellows have, it, have increased, and especially the reds have gotten smaller. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done on improving solubility, how we calculate it, argue that's one of the most important and fundamental physical chemical properties that remains one of the hardest to actually calculate. So how do we pull all this stuff together, right? Um, this can, can be done in spot fire for a variety of reasons I'm not gonna go into now. We chose several years ago to use Vortex. Um, well, I'll mention one of them. Uh, it, Genentech, we support both Mac and Windows. Uh, Vortex is one of the few tools that per performs well on both platforms. It's also quite easily scriptable and programmable. And so we take a similar approach here that we took with the molecular modeling tools, PyMol and Mo. Behind the scenes, there's a pretty standard informatics infrastructure that we've built that's scriptable. Each project team's computational chemist is responsible for maintaining a script that's custom for their project that pulls all of the assay, DMPK, uh, crystallographic results, calculated properties, chemical structures that are relevant for their project from the corporate database uh, into a template and then pushes that into a vortex session. These are used internally for our project teams. We also share these externally. Um, part of our infrastructure also has to maintain the ability to support on the order of 250 to 300 external chemists that we work with uh, in several different companies as collaborators and CROs. And we share this SAR data with them through, through Vortex actually. Um, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with these kind of simple histogram and pie charts and radar plot analyses. The key point here is I can, I can substructure search this easily, similarity search it. We've built in some other like match pair type searches. Uh, Vortex supports some of their own now. There's some R group analyses features. However, I go about finding the molecules, any one that I select will be highlighted in all these different views. So it's a, it's a nice, 
uh, visualization tool where I can look for structure, property, and structure activity relationship uh, correlations. The next step then was to link that to the 3D graphics. And here I've shown doing it in PyMole. We've also done this in Mo. So that if I find some interesting molecules somewhere in my vortex spreadsheet, I can select one as I've done on, um, you'll see in the, the two plots in the center of the screen, I've the arrows on, uh, on the lower plot on one dot, which is one molecule, it's highlighted in the upper graph in Vortex. And that molecule's coordinates are then sent through a web service into PyMole, so that whenever we click on somebody, we can view it in 3D immediately. Uh, of course, you could do that if it's a co-crystal structure or if it's a docking model. Um, which is just showing sending yet a third one in there. So this was the beginning of how we started integrating the 2D chemical informatics and SAR world to the 3D visualization. And our goal there was to realize that you know, thanks to the advances in structural biology, um, although it's a much more complicated kind of data, we want to be able to treat crystal structures like another type of assay and be able to easily associate them and integrate them with all of the other assays that, that we use to make decisions. There's um, another recent innovation that came from Seth Harris, a crystallographer here at Genentech. Um, really clever idea. T-Toys is software he built to really make his and other structural biologists workflows and analysis easier. A lot of it has you know, cool features specific to crystallographers, but there's a few things that those of us that are doing structure-based design got really excited about. Um, and let me show you what that looks like. So the idea here is that a simple way to classify and interrogate structures isn't just by substructure or sequence searching. It's by looking at distances, or they could be angles or pseudo torsions between different parts of a protein or protein ligand complex. So, for example, some of those distances highlighted here. Um, so, my next slide here in Seth's. Um, simple HTML spreadsheet, he's made it easy to enter a distance as a pair of atoms between, in this case, an atom at the end of the P loop of abel kinase um, and to another atom elsewhere on the protein that's relatively fixed. And the idea there is that as you go from one crystal structure to the next, as that P loop moves, of course, that distance will change. If I sort on that column, then I can traverse all the structures that I'm now visualizing in PyMole or Mo or whatever your favorite tool is in order, and I can see a smooth motion of that loop and make it easy, easier to spot where there might be other correlated motions or perhaps activity or selectivity differences. A really simple approach and not too hard to implement. Um, you can also imagine, I, I don't think I have an example here, extending that to sort of a heat map analysis, where in the heat map, maybe I'm looking at two different distances amongst a series of many co-crystal structures and color coding it based on a potency or selectivity or some other property. Um, and those kind of analyses then can be, can be pulled right back into the Vortex chemical spreadsheet viewer, which has heat maps and all kinds of other nice graphic visualization tools. So I want to give you a couple quick sort of computational design SAR examples. Um, this was some work done a few years ago on a project here where the goal was to come up with inhibitors to JAK1 kinase that are selective versus JAK2. Um, these two active sites are almost identical. There are very small changes. One of the few is a difference highlighted here that in uh, JAK2, you have an aspartate at one position, which is a glutamate in JAK1. Of course, the glutamate is one methylene longer, and that suggested to the design team 
maybe they could figure out how to prefer preferentially interact with that longer glutamate and get a stronger interaction in Jack Mill. So that's the approach they took. And after a fair amount of empirical analoging, here's where they wound up. Turns out that isopropyl alcohol group bought them about 30 fold selectivity, um, starting from molecules that were about two and a half to three fold selective, improving those about tenfold. And that got them to where they needed to be. The crystal structure there is showing you a jack one um, with the glutamate. And on the next slide, um, shows you results of co-crystal structures, a nice match pair example, showing what's going on, and that provides an interpretation. Um, unfortunately, in this case, it was after the fact. When the design work was done, all the crystallography really wasn't working perfectly yet. Um, and we also didn't have the water analysis tool. So what I'm giving you here is a retrospective example that's highlighted how we think about those problems in other systems today. But the, the key concept here is pretty simple. In JAK1, it's making a direct hydrogen bond from that isopropyl alcohol to one of the glutamate oxygens. Whereas in JAK2, it's making it through a bridging water. Uh, we then applied Schrodinger's water map and open eyes SHMAP calculations to that, just to see what we could learn. And qualitatively, they give us similar results. The, the methods behind each of those programs are very different. They're both trying to get to the same concept, which is to give us design clues for which waters are likely to be thermodynamically unstable and therefore good candidates to displace. Or conversely, waters that are likely to be really tightly bound in a protein and instead would be better targets to think of to interact with. In this case, both of those tools gave a qualitatively similar result. We use both of them today, also a, a simpler one that comes out of uh, Proasis for analyzing waters. Uh, we still haven't come up with a consistent best practice to recommend one over the other. We use, we use them qualitatively to frame design hypotheses. So I wanna give you a, a, a quick, uh, really nice fragment-based discovery story. We've done a lot of work in fragment-based approaches here. Uh, this target that we worked on a few years ago called NAMPT. Uh, this was published in JMET Chem last year. Um, it's a really cool fragment-based discovery story. This is an incredibly well-behaved protein, high-resolution crystal structures. Uh, if most proteins behave this way, fragment-based discovery would be, for that matter, the rest of structure-based design a whole lot easier. Right, so the, in the, the dark uh, blue and yellow vectors in there are a very weak fragment hit, a 200 micromolar, modest ligand efficiency, that's what the 0.36 is. Superimposed on it with the light green vectors is a previous co-crystal structure of a more advanced lead compound. Shown at the bottom of the slide here. Um, there were a variety of reasons why the team wanted to replace part of that group and so this was a simple, really, a, a very simple hybrid design strategy where you take the fragment and recognize based on the post crystal structures, these are overlays pretty, pretty easily, splice the two together. And you can see it worked out pretty well. That new fragment, optimized fragment, improved potency a lot. It still has a ways to go to get down to where the lead is. Um, but clearly the concept of work got them in the right direction. There's a further extension of it, adding, adding on some more groups on the right-hand side. An important lesson that came out of this that's not so unusual in fragment-based projects, probably a little more dramatic here than many others, is that different small or very similar small molecules can bind differently. In this case, they're very weak. They're both about 100 micromolar KD. These are via core KDs. When the crystal structures were obtained for these, you can see that they have really different binding modes. In, in each case, the fragment is the dark blue molecule in the center of that salt and accessible surface. Um, it might be tempting to look at that and say, well, 
Now, how am I ever going to get any useful SAR out of this? It's, it's bouncing around in the site. Um, I think by now, most of us would argue, think of that as a design opportunity instead and treat them really as different scaffolds as opposed to an analog of each other. And recognize that each offers different vectors to come off the design. Test each of those vectors with some simple designs and see if the molecule stays more or less put. Um, and that's how we approach fragment-based discovery um, in general on many other targets as well, is to say that you group the scaffold to the fragments based on their pose, ideally from a crystal structure, not just the 2D structure. We've got one more story I'm going to summarize, which was, I thought, a, a really nice, clean example of the multivariate property-driven design and structure-based design. This was on uh, lactate dehydrogenase, uh, an oncology target we worked on here a little while ago. From high throughput chemical screening, um, this rather unusual hit came out, pretty weak, biochemical potency, single-digit micromolar, uh, very strongly NAD-dependent binding. Crystal structure shows that it interacts with NAD. What made these particularly interesting is this complex behavior of tautomers and ionization, where you can see there's a, a negative charge that can be delocalized through a fairly large system. And we saw what the crystal structure looked like. That was really unusual. Um, let me see if I can get this whiteboard to really work. Let's pick that guy. Right. So We've got an interaction from that uh, enone type system on that six membered ring to an arginine. It's a little hard to see where this other interaction from, is coming from the arginine. It's actually coming from the sulfur. And then there's another one from this other oxygen to a histidine. And then in addition, um, this is an edge-to-face interaction between this ar aromatic ring in the inhibitor to that aromatic ring. It stabilizes that folded conformation. All pretty unusual features. Um, with that kind of a PKA, not surprisingly, it was pretty tough to optimize these guys to get into cells. That turned out to be a big challenge. The way the team decided to approach that was to vary these two groups here, I'm calling X and Y, in a simple matrix design. Um, we could predict their effect on PKA, but I'm going to show you here the measurements, the biochemical potencies and experimental measurements, measurements for permeability and plasma protein binding. So as that matrix was filled out, that allowed them to compare all four of those properties. Um, Co-crystal structures were obtained for a number of those guys. Binding mode is retained. And that let them converge on the design in that lower left-hand corner, where instead of the, so you still have the sulfur linker, but now in the, uh, in the ring, you've replaced the original atom with, with uh, a nitrogen. So I'm just going to sum up with um, sort of, how would I put these? I guess sort of my pet scientific peeves that I think hold us back as a field is computational chemistry and structure-based design. Um, the first item I put there mostly because of getting excited by stuff that happened in the Cambridge database um, contest. I think it was in 2007 that one group first started showing success in de novo prediction of small molecule crystal structures. Subsequently, many more groups have had pretty good success. I wouldn't call that a totally solved problem, but it looks like it's going to get there. The reason I got excited about that is reasoning if you can solve that, you can probably get to the point where you could actually predict solubility, which of course has to be an equilibrium between um, the gas phase to water phase free energy of transfer of a small molecule and also the free energy of transfer out of a crystal lattice to the gas phase. But we're, we're still quite a ways from being able to pull that off. 
Um, I hope the state of the art in predicting solubility isn't this simple equation that GSK published. Um, so if there's anybody out there interested in that problem, I encourage you to keep working on it. It, it is really hard. I've also mentioned in passing, even gaining agreement on what the experimental assay for solubility is, turns out to be very difficult. Um, being able to predict accurate co-crystal structures is still pretty tough. Docking methods, uh, energy minimization from available co-crystal structures can occasionally get to, to that, be that good, but in general, it's going to be more like two to a half angstroms RMSD. If it, most of us who have tried um, physics-based approaches to scoring and predicting potency would argue that you really do need high quality structure to have a fighting chance of getting there. We're still pretty far away from being able to computationally predict large ligand induced conformational changes. Ligand induced is probably a misnomer. What almost certainly is happening is proteins are sampling a variety of metastable, low energy conformations. The right ligand happens to be present that can trap one of those metastable conformations. But our, our ability to be able to predict those, including what might be a transient, say, allosteric site, is, is still really poor. I'm excited by the work going on at the D.E. Shaw Institute and groups like B.J. Pandey, who through different um, MD type methods can see very large scale change, but these are huge, really long simulations. This is another one that's always kind of bugged me, I've yet to hear a satisfying answer to, is why doesn't affinity increase as you add more contacts between two molecules? There's a famous paper from PNAS in 1999 that poses that question. I think the answer still isn't clear. Um, another one I'd mentioned thinking about that kinase example between JAK1 and JAK2. In that case, the problem was mostly solved through first order interactions. There could be much longer range ones we should be able to take advantage of. Electrostatics is the most long range force in intermolecular interactions. There's been remarkably little work done on incorporating that into structure-based design. Uh, Bruce Teeter at MIT has published some really nice papers on, on an approach like that. Um, I'm not sure that it's actually been followed a whole lot yet. And finally, if we could begin to do many of these things, I think we could get to sort of a holy grail of MedChem design, which is could I predict the optimization path from an initial hit through multiple liberations to get me to a lead? And, and finally, I'll wrap it up by saying um, what we focused on is tying together that structure based design world, 3D models preferred torsion angles, low energy conformations, preferred interactions with multi-parameter optimization with GMPK parameters, calculated properties, and so on. I'll show you how we tie together those models. Ideally, you want to optimize multiple positions and parameters together rather than one at a time. Um, SAR is seldom additive at multiple positions. If you do focus on one position at a time, you're likely to optimize yourself into a local minimum it's very hard to get out of. Um, we emphasize hypothesis-driven design so that every molecule that gets proposed and synthesized is testing some specific hypothesis. Um, if you've done the design well, you may be able to learn about that hypothesis, even if the design failed to achieve its desired potency or solubility or clearance goal. Um, Structure-based design is now routinely used by all our medicinal chemists, including our collaborators and many of the CRO chemists. And then finally emphasize something that I think is really important to remember. This was the subject of the entire, well, a big part of the subject of the entire Computational Chemistry Gordon Conference a couple of years ago. Blind predictions are the best test for models and improving them. The literature in our field of docking, QSR, and so on is mostly full of retrospective predictions. And it um, turns out to be a whole lot harder to predict stuff when you don't know the answer. Um, and then it's important to remember to compare that model, whether it's docking or a QSAR versus a reasonable null hypothesis. And that null hypothesis might be, what does your medicinal chemist predict? Or for a virtual screening method, just molecular weight. 
surprisingly many docking results just correlated with multiple rates. And then finally, I want to thank all the people. This is uh, the group that, that uh, I lead, other people from our IT groups, and then key software companies we've worked with. And then uh, I'll conclude there. And I guess we can do questions next, right? Hello? <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, thanks every, uh, thanks Jeff for a great talk. We're ready to take some questions. So I'm going to start you out with, um, I thought it was really interesting where you were talking uh, around tw slide 20 someplace where you're talking about uh, looking at the distances between parts of the protein um, and the, the molecule that you're docking in there. Um, were there any lessons learned in that sort of looking at those distances, you know, something more than just, you know, you kind of have to space it out and not have things too close, you know, sterically to some of those pieces. Um, that's the question. A couple specific projects that I can't share that gave some, I'd say, insights that are hypotheses far from proven into selectivity in looking at uh, some particular emotions that were qualitatively correlated with selectivity for one target versus another. So those are the kind of patterns we're looking for. And we're, we're still learning how to do that. I think on you know, project teams have only had the availability of dozens to maybe hundreds or more crystal structures in the last few years. We've just now gotten the tools to analyze them and look at them as a, as a whole in place in the last couple of years. Okay, uh, we have a question, and I'm sorry if I butcher this person's name, but we have a question from Sneha Mascarenhas, um, who is asking if, will in silico work be sufficient to broaden IP filing around potential bioactives uh, to protect possible subsequent interchangeables and biosimilars from being developed? Right, so um, I'm pretty certain the answer to that is no. I qualify that by saying you know, I'm, a, I'm a chemist and cheminformatics person, not a patent attorney, however, worked closely with them for years. And one of the key requirements in filing and getting a patent is reduction to practice, which means you have to have made the molecule and shown experimental results. And having said that, patents do expand to a lot of virtual molecules. Um, but I've not been part of any strategies uh, which are aware of others that have successfully defended IP of chemical matter with only virtual design. Okay, I have another question. Uh, <clears throat> Someone is asking, uh, this is a person from FDA, Ying Mu, how do you validate your predictions? But much of the literature on computational methods tends to be retrospective, reproducing literature data. Um, in any of the companies doing drug discovery, the reason they employ computational chemists, cheminformatics, and so on, our job is to hopefully improve the efficiency of how experiments get done. And so all the stuff I talked about is all about creating hypotheses and predictive tools to influence design. So the only way is prediction or to validate predictions is by experiment. Okay, here's a uh, person from the University of Connecticut asking, how can you distinguish between structure-based drug design and docking studies done using molecular dynamics studies? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, Tony, it's not appearing on the screen. Can you can you repeat it for me again? Okay, I just I sent it, the text over to you, Jeff. Um, but basically, the question is, how can you distinguish between structure-based drug design and docking studies done using molecular dynamics studies? Okay, um, so I'm not quite sure what the question means. But so for if there's three parts of that. So structure-based design, what the way we would typically approach that is an iterative design by altering one or more known co-crystal structures, for example, swapping a scaffold, moving heteratoms around, closing a ring, breaking a ring. Um, dynamics, um, we actually do not use much except in the context of some free energy perturbation simulations that we're working on testing to see how useful they can be in more quantitative uh, methods for predicting structure. Um, molecular dynamics is an analysis tool, not a design tool. Um, hang on, my phone just took off. Right. Um, some approaches I've seen used, in, including done myself in the past with MD, have been to use that to shake up a protein ligand crystal structure that includes an analog we've designed to test how stable is the local minimum that molecule is in. But MD, whether it's done with FEP or an MPBSA or just long dynamics trajectories is an analysis tool. So I'm not aware of ways to use that in design. And I mentioned in docking, also not a design tool. If we had a scoring function that any of us believed in for docking, it could be a design tool. I spent a long time working on that problem before only to conclude docking is the wrong problem. The right problem is scoring. How do you predict, how do you predict the free energy of binding? If you can solve that, then there's a number of docking engines that we could throw uh, designs at, dock them, and then score them. So I hope that sort of answers the question. All right, I'm going to ask one more question. This is the last one. Uh, someone from Chatham University is asking about um, different crystal structures are often obtained with one protein uh, with a substrate or an inhibitor bound. He wants to know how much does that play into the predicted ligands that you get out of your, um, your, your design calculations? Um, and could, you know, could that affect which ones you obtain? Yeah, for sure. Um, ideally, we want co-crystal structures with the, the most similar ligands to the ones we're working on in chemistry. So, for example, an APO protein crystal structure often is not very relevant to a bound one. The active site or binding site may open or change its shape considerably depending on the ligand that's bound. Some classes of proteins are really notorious for that, like nuclear hormone receptors are incredibly flexible, move a lot from one chemical series to another. Um, some others like serine proteases tend to be better behaved, more rigid. The one example protein I had in there called NAMT, pretty much a rock. Uh, kinases are highly flexible. So anyway, the, the short story is, yeah, for sure we want the most relevant ligand we can. If we base, say, all of our kinase inhibitor design on a co-crystal structure, say, with ATP or ADP and P, we would be severely misled because of all the flexibility in those systems. Um, that's why over time there's been so much investment made in protein engineering and all the other many parts that drive crystallographic success so that we can get what are typically soaps um, of small molecules bound into protein crystals fast enough to drive chemistry. And by fast enough, I'd say, we want that turnaround time to be a couple of weeks. All right. Well, as I said, that was our last question. That's all the time we have. Many thanks to Jeff for a terrific talk. And many thanks to all of you for tuning in. This concludes CNEN's second annual virtual symposium. 
If, however, you missed any of the talks earlier in the day, let me remind you that they will be available on demand at the conference website for three months after the live broadcast. Have a great night, Chemketeers. <laughs>